this is another webinar from Telepharma Chambers um, in our ongoing attempt to bring clarity to various issues. Um, today, we have a webinar, as you know, about um, um, the lasting effects of EU law, meaning EU law in the UK, of course. And just for those of you who are interested in more uh, of these webinar things, a week today, that's Tuesday the 26th of May, there'll be a webinar um, on uh, employment law, um, in, particularly in relation to the knock-on effect of COVID-19 and what have you. So that's looking for the future. Looking to now at today's talk, we've got, as you will have seen a number of speakers, I'll mention them right about myself, of course, I'm going to give the introductory talk. Dennis Edwards is going to give his not-so-fast talk, warning us that no matter what you might think from looking at the uh, withdrawal agreement, and particularly the 2018 Act, EU law is actually going to hang around for a long time in the UK. And then Mark Lazarovitz is going to talk in particular about EU citizens' rights. Um, at the end of the session, there will be a question, there'll be time for questions and answers. At the bottom of your screens, you should have a Q&A button. Um, if, you, if you use that to type in your questions, I will call the questions up at the end of the last talk. And if there are any questions, um, whoever the question is addressed to will uh, attempt to deal with it. And just as a final uh, message, um, the slides, I think we, I at least am going to alter my slides somewhat after this talk, but once they've been updated, the slides will be available uh, to everybody. So with that introduction, I'm going to plunge into my talk, which as you can see is called EU law in the UK after Brexit, the nuts and bolts. And the first point I want to make this, this is just to remind you of how we got to even wondering about what the nuts and bolts are. And it's, I've got a number of landmarks, partly political, uh, partly legal. We had the Brexit referendum in the summer of 2016. We had the famous Article 50 letter in May 2017. And then we know that the end of the Article 50 period was extended twice. We then had a very important statute, the European Union Withdrawal Act in 2018, which the European Communities Act 1972 on exit day. I'll come back to that later. We then had, of course, the lengthy negotiations of what came to be called the withdrawal agreement between the UK and the other member states. That was to, tied up in January of this year. Uh, and then we had the European Union Withdrawal Agreement Act this year, 2020, which, which um, effectively implemented the withdrawal agreement and in doing so amended the 2018 Act, but also contained some bits of its own, which I'll mention later and with which Mark will be concerned. So now we get to one of those basic undergraduate rules which underpin various stages of what I'm going to say. And it's just a reminder that international treaties are not part of the law of the UK. Now, there, there are precedents as long as you're wrong about this, but in typical, um, elegant, short, sharp prose, the Supreme Court in the first of the Miller cases in 2017 put it like this, although they're binding on the United Kingdom in international law, treaties are not part of UK law and they give rise to no legal rights or obligations in uh, domestic law. And so um, the consequence of that is that um, when we join the European communities, as they were then called, uh, in 1972, the mere fact that we signed up to the Euratom Treaty and the Cold and Steel Treaty and the European Economic Community Treaty didn't mean that those treaties became part of our law. What we had instead was the European Communities Act 1972, which imported them into the United Kingdom. Um, the key provision is Section 2.1, but in fact, rather than take you through it, and it's quite technical language. I'm going to rely again on the Miller case because, again, we have an absolutely first-class summary of what 
the key provision of the Act does. Under the terms of the 1972 Act, EU law may take effect as part of the law of the United Kingdom in three ways. First, the EU treaties themselves are directly applicable by virtue of Section 2.1. Again, that is absolutely the key section of the Act. Some of the provisions of those treaties create rights and duties which are directly applicable in the sense that they are enforceable in the UK courts. In other words, you don't need any domestic legislation, they're just part of our law. Secondly, where the effect of UK treaties is, the EU legislation is, sorry, EU legislation is directly applicable in domestic law. Section 2, 1 provides that it is to have direct effect in the United Kingdom. And again, without the need for further domestic regulation, uh, legislation. And the court gives us this obvious example, obvious to anyone who studied this at university. This applies to EU regulations, which are directly applicable by their very nature. Thirdly, this is the third way of EU law becoming part of our law. Section two, section, subsection two, this is two subsection two, authorizes the implementation of EU law by delegated legislation. This applies mainly to EU directives, which are not in general, are directly applicable, but are required to be transposed into, into national law. And for example, for anybody watching who um, is familiar with company law, you'll remember that the second uh, European uh, company law dive formulated a rule which prohibited the granting by a company of financial assistance for the purchase of its own shares. And that um, was merely a directive, so it didn't of itself have force in the UK, but it was given effect by uh, the relevant provisions of the Companies Act 1985. So that's just an example. What I'd like to do now is to uh, pass on to um, what happens uh, once we've got past the referendum, we've got past uh, the Article 50 letter, the European Union Withdrawal Act 2018 has been amended. I'll come to the amended version later. But the key provision is Section 1, which has not changed. The European Communities Act 1972 is repealed on exit day. Now, it so happens that the definition of exit day has changed uh, from time to time. Um, but uh, in fact, it is now the, um, it was, it's come and gone now, of course, it was the uh, 31st of January 2020. Uh, what I'd like to do now is look at the withdrawal agreement, which was negotiated right up to um, to January of this of this year, um, and therefore, actually, after, clearly after the original form of the 2018 Act had been enacted, um, one of the key things in the withdrawal agreement is the use of the expression transition period, and it's defined as meaning a transition or implementation period which starts on 1st of February 2020. That's the day after exit day what we Brits call exit day, and ends on the 31st of December 2020. Now that is subject to, that is subject to possible extension, and it's something of which uh, they, uh, there is absolutely uh, no sign at the moment. Um, <clears throat> a key provision, if we can just go back a page, sorry, um, a key provision of the withdrawal agreement is Article 4, which says is the provisions of this agreement and the provisions of union law made applicable by this agreement shall produce in respect of and in the United Kingdom the same legal effects as those which they produce within the union and its member states. So it's keeping us in under the general uh, umbrella of, uh, of, of EU law. That's Article 4. Um, I'm going to say a few things now uh, more generally about what else is in the uh, in the treaty. I'll come to Article 1 through 7, maybe we can keep that on screen, just to give you a feeling for the, the look and feel of this uh, treaty. Um, we have got uh, a treaty which runs into 181 pages, it's got a uh, preamble, of course, it's got some standard provisions, it's got schedules, uh, it's 
of things and to give you the feeling of what it covers, I'm going to give a rapid gallop through the different parts of it. Part one is called with common, is common provisions, for example, including definitions, the meaning of what it means to refer to union law. Part two is of interest to Mark in his talk. It's concerned with citizens' rights, including, for example, rights of residents, workers' rights, self-employed persons' rights, mutual recognition of professional qualifications, the coordination of social security systems. Part three, if I can just rearrange my papers, part three is entitled separate provisions. Now that's a title which tells us nothing, but in part three there are crowned masses of provisions governing uh, the, the staying in force of EU uh, law for a certain period, and it covers a lot of the things you can think of. Uh, intellectual property, ongoing VAT duty matters, judicial and police cooperation in criminal matters, uh, enforcement of judgments, Euratom issues, pending cases before the European Court, uh, so-called administrative procedures, including competition law, state aid law, existing state aid, new state aid, and it goes on and on. And in and to return to all years after the end of this transition period in cases which were opened up during the period. It's a good example of how, uh, coming, thinking ahead to, to, to Dennis's talk, of how European law is going to hang on and be with us uh, for quite some time. Um, if I, looking now to Article 127, um, that says, uh, uh, this is this is now part of part four within the within the uh, within the uh, within the um, transition period. Uh, unless otherwise provided in this agreement, union law shall be applicable to and in the United Kingdom during the trans. So we've got this clear statement that from now until the thirty first of December this year, according to the treaty, according to the drawn agreement, union law is to be applicable. And then we've got the standard wording in sub three there about it producing uh, rights and so on. Um, coming back now, that, that's from part four, just to give you a feeling of what else is in the treaty, part five deals with financial provisions, including the UK's contribution to and participation in the UK budget. Part six uh, is rather boringly entitled institutional and financial provisions, but includes, for example, the setting up of a joint committee, which is responsible for implementation and application of the withdrawal agreement, and it sets up a dispute, uh, a dispute uh, uh, resolution uh, um, uh, procedure. Um, I think now we can look at the next slide. Um, and this takes us to the amended form of the uh, European Union Withdrawal Act. I pause again to remind you that the mere fact of the United Kingdom entering into the withdrawal agreement would of itself have produced no effect in UK domestic law. So what we have is the 2020 Act, which I'll come to later, but the main thing it does is make detailed amendments to the 2018 Act. Now here, just to confuse everybody hopelessly, um, I must point out that the uh, slide you have got on screen has been overtaken by drafting of mine, and I'm going to turn now to that drafting of mine. Um, the one thing to say now builds on what you can see in front of you, but it will appear in the final version of the slide for distribution. Uh, what does the 2018 Act do in a nutshell? It creates an important distinction as a matter of definition of what is called exit day, which is still the 31st of January 2020, so exit day has come and gone, and something called IP completion date, and IP means the implementation period or the transition period, which is mentioned in the withdrawal agreement, and that date is the 31st of December uh, uh, 2020. It repeals 
1972 Act with effect from exit day. So we just pause there. Exit day has come and gone. The 1972 Act has been repealed. Thirdly, it takes a snapshot uh, of what is called EU-derived domestic legislation. That means, in general, any EU legislation passed by the UK under the 1972 Act as it stood the day before exit day. So that's our own legislation which we created to implement directives and what have you. And it, and it saves, that's the word it uses, it saves that legislation by keeping it in force in the UK on and after exit day. So it's in force right now. The next thing, if we can pass to the next slide, um, uh, and it's need to look to me as if this, this slide is up to date, despite what I told you. It takes another snapshot. Uh, Dennis will be talking about ASPI, but we're both saying the same thing. It takes another snapshot of what is called direct EU legislation. So that means regulations and decisions, for example, which were automatically part of member states' law, as those things stood immediately before exit day, and it incorporates that by making it part of UK domestic law on and after exit day. It's actually quite a clever way of dealing with it. The regulations were not part of our law, and so you couldn't save them because they weren't part of our law to be saved. So they're incorporated into the law instead. Quite an important uh, a distinction. What it also do, does, quite naturally, is preserve on and after exit day all the rights and obligations and remedies created by that famous provision of the 1972 Act, Art, uh, section, section 2.1, which you looked at towards the beginning of this talk. Now, I've got a few more points to make. Um, the Act sets out provisions for the interpretation of what is called retained EU law. And that's EU-derived domestic law, our own legislation, direct legislation that has just been uh, uh, implemented into our law, and what is called retained case law, which, which by and large means what it says on and after exit day. Because all this is happening right now. The key provisions are these. A UK court or tribunal is not bound by any decisions made by the EU courts on or after IP completion day. They're bound by decisions made by the EU courts this year up to the 31st of December, but they're not bound by such decisions after the 31st of December 2020. Refer any matter to the European Court on or after IP completion day. Um, we then have provisions saying that in, in retained, sorry, I'm just getting a message about my connection, in retained EU case law, um, and what are called retained EU general principles, as they stood just before IP completion date, those are con continue to govern the retained law in the UK. So, the, so you, European principles of interpretation will apply. The Supreme Court is not bound by any retained EU case law. This is quite interesting. It's not bound by any retained EU case law, but after the 31st of December this year, it will be able to, quotes, have regard, have regard to that case law, uh, which is a form of words we've seen elsewhere, for example, in the Competition Act um, 1998, where the court had regard to pronouncements by the Commission on Competition Law. Um, if we could perhaps move over the page, um, the Act also provides, and this is Section 5, to exceptions to all the saving and incorporation that I've been talking about. For example, the principle of the supremacy of EU law does not apply to any enactment or rule of law passed or made after exit day. That's interesting, not passed or made after the 31st of December this year, but created after exit day, so things created right now. And importantly, the EU's charter of fundamental rights is not part of domestic law after exit day, so it is already gone. Don't forget, the EU charter of fundamental rights is not the same as the European uh, Convention 
uh, on, on, on rights. Uh, that, that stays in force so long as we're a party to, to, to that. Um, importantly, it allows retained EU law to be amended by primary or subordinate legislation. So although it is being uh, frozen in a snapshot, it can evolve by subsequent scratchings and scrapings away to make it change as time goes by. And of course, crucially, it gives effect to the withdrawal agreement. I say on my note, it now does so because the original 2018 Act was before the withdrawal agreement. It gives effect, it does this by keeping the 1970s Act in force, even though it's just been repealed by Section 1, it's in force until the IP completion date, which is the 31st December this year, as though as though references in it to the treaties included part four of the withdrawal treatment. So what that is doing, that formal words is doing, is making the part four provisions of the treaty, which govern the transition period, part of our law until the 31st of uh, December. Now, that's what I say about uh, that. And... Uh, I now come to the final part of my talk, and that is what does the European Union Withdrawal Agreement Act 2020 do? do? Uh, well, first of all, it amends the 2018 Act to bring it up to date with the Withdrawal Agreement. I've tried to give you a bit of the flavor of that. Uh, it sets out in part three provisions on citizens' rights, which um, uh, are going to be of interest in Mark's talk. And for what it is worth, it declares the sovereignty of uh, English Parliament. And that concludes my talk, save for this health warning, that uh, all I've managed to give in this 20 odd minutes is quite frankly, a toy town guide to the law. I've tried to give you the chunky bits, but there's a lot of devil in the detail. So with that, I conclude my talk. Thank you for listening, and I hand you over to Dennis. Yes, everyone. Thank you, Michael. Um, so I'm now just going to uh, drill down into um, a little bit of detail on three points. And the main headline is that uh, those who think we're going to break free quickly from uh, the EU, I think, are delusional because EU law is going to last uh, for quite a long time, I think. Uh, so if I move then to my overview, uh, and I'm aiming to speak for about 20 minutes as well. So Michael has given a, although he called it a toy town guide, it's, I think it's a pretty thorough um, overview of the withdrawal scheme. Um, and at one level, of course, the withdrawal scheme is pretty straightforward in that it aims to maintain legal certainty. Uh, and preserve EU law in the UK um, unless and until it's changed. Um, and of course, that is um, the position. Exit day has passed, um, but we're in the transitional period. Um, and in the end, the questions I'm interested in are what's going to happen to EU law after the end of the implementation period, after the end of this transitional period. Um, and so when I'm referring to exit day, uh, although that's the 31st of January 2020, in reality, I'm talking about the real exit day, which is the implementation, the end of the implementation period. Uh, and as Michael has said, um, after the end of the implementation period, broadly EU law will continue in the UK um, after the end of the implementation period, um, unless and until it is changed by UK institutions. So that, um, as I say, uh, a snapshot is taken of EU law uh, basically on the 31st of January 2020. EU law in all its parts is, is sort of preserved in ASPIC uh, on that day, uh, and it will continue uh, into the future, um, at, uh, including after the end of the implementation period, uh, unless and until it is changed by the legislature or, um, as Michael uh, indicated in some circumstances, the Supreme Court or for that matter any court, um, deciding to go a different way. So the upshot is that after exit day, uh, or certainly after the end of the implementation period, uh, the UK can change EU law as it pleases. Now, I have some doubts that the legislature is going to do that in a big way. Um, uh, we all know that the legislature's attention to detail is pretty short. Um, and I think the experience of other legal systems where transitions have taken place uh, 
is that it takes a long time, if ever, for the legislature to catch up. Um, so if I have a little bit of um, experience in Hong Kong, for example, and one of the striking things about Hong Kong is how badly the legislature has sought to update legislation. And I know there are other political issues going on there, but uh, legislatures by their nature are conservative with a small c, and unless they're excited by something, they won't change it. So probably the first big thing to say is that the idea there's going to be a massive overhaul of the statute book is, is unrealistic. So after exit day, yes, the UK can change EU law as it pleases, um, but in reality, matters are going to be a, a lot more complicated. So there are a number of reasons for that, and I've identified five of them there. So the first issue is longer transitional arrangements. Obviously, we can't rule that out. There's going to be a longer transition, and they might go on for three more years, for example, in which case, in which case we are sort of in a purgatory or a sort of um, halfway house um, not being able to influence EU laws, but still bound by them and how they change during the transitional period. So there could be longer transitional arrangements. And even as things stand, as Mark is going to explain later, um, there is a longer transitional period with citizens' rights. Um, and in fact, uh, that, that could go on uh, for um, the length of the life of a child, of a current child who's an EU citizen with residence rights in the UK. So anyway, potentially um, 150 years or, or, or more, that there is, at least in theory, um, a transitional arrangement in relation to citizens' rights. So that's a very long time uh, in that context. Uh, then, of course, there is the terms of any new agreement between the UK and the EU. So clearly there's going to be some sort of free trade um, agreement um, and no doubt we're going to enter into free trade agreements with lots of other states as well. Um, and uh, there is a, a big world out there of world trade law and international investment law, uh, all of which, of course, is a compromise of sovereignty. Now, we've been rather um, insulated from, from the realities of this by virtue of our membership of the EU. Uh, because EU law has more or less mediated um, international obligations in the context of uh, inward investment and world trade law and so on. But we're now going to be exposed to that directly. Um, and that's going to be true both with the rest of the world and with the EU. So there are going to be limitations on our, uh, inverted commas, sovereignty by virtue of the international trading uh, arrangements that we, we, are, we, we, we wish to enter. So, for example, it will not, still not be possible to have discriminatory taxation. Uh, it will still not be possible to discriminate against imports um, by virtue of whatever uh, free trade uh, agreements uh, that we enter. So there's going to be a continuing impact of EU-like rules on our legal system uh, just by virtue of the fact that um, we're, you know, we're not an island in any legal sense uh, and we are going to have to relate to the rest of the world. Now, those are two, um, if you like, wider political observations, but the three legal things that I'm wanting to focus on, uh, what the first of them Michael has already touched on is that there will continue to be judicial reliance on EU law long into the future in applying retained EU law. So I want to say a little bit more about that in a moment uh, by reference to a recent Supreme Court decision. And then secondly, uh, there are going to continue to be historic claims by reference to EU law. Now, what I mean by that is that the facts of a case will have arisen five, ten years ago, um, but will only come to fruition or litigation in the future after we've left the, EU, after we've left the transitional period. And clearly, uh, just simply on ordinary rule of law grounds, cases have to be determined by reference to the law that applied when they happened, uh, and so EU law is going to continue um, in, in this context for, for some time into the future. Um, and then thirdly, there is a very particular situation uh, that I'm interested in, a little bit complicated, uh, but the long and the short of it is a rule of law consideration, uh, which is going to require us, it seems to me, to continue to have regard in, uh, to, to EU law um, uh, as a rule for deciding cases into the future. So let me come to the first of these three categories then uh, very briefly. Uh, and so what I'm interested in here is that EU law will inevitably continue to be applied in the UK when legal terms in EU UK law, which are derived from EU law, have to be interpreted and applied. 
So as Michael explained, um, the retained EU law is more or less all of EU law that is carried over into UK law um, after exit day. Now that can turn, can, as we all know, that can, contains a vast number of legal terms, all of which have an EU providence and will have to be interpreted by reference to EU law. So to take a simple example, the term worker uh, has a particular meaning in EU law for the purposes of the residence directive. Uh, similarly, what a public contract is, um, is something that's going to have to be interpreted in the context of how it's understood both historically and later in light of EU law. So there's going to be a, a huge amount of terms that will continue to be defined in the law by reference to EU law and decisions of the ECJ. Now, let's take a simple example, um, slightly factually complicated because it concerns VAT. Um, I'm not sure how many of um, the people listening are VAT lawyers, but um, we can be reasonably straightforward. Uh, we can stay, explain this in reasonably straightforward terms. So in uh, a few weeks ago, in the Zipfit case uh, against HMRC, the UK Supreme Court was faced with the need to interpret what you might think are pretty fundamental concepts in the VAT scheme. Uh, so as we all know with VAT, there is output tax, uh, which the person to whom we sell our goods and services has to pay. And there is input tax, which we recover um, in order to uh, make the supplies which um, we as a taxable person um, can make. Now, in order to recover input tax, uh, the law both in the EU and the UK is that you have to have a compliant invoice. In other words, you have to have an, in, an invoice setting out the amount of output tax which you charge to your customer before you can recover any input tax. Now, in this case, um, it had had a long history, um, and the long and the short of it was that it was thought for a long time that mail services were exempt from that. But sometime in the past, the Court of Justice chain, it made clear that that was not the case. Now, the, the, the appellant Zipfit here had made a supply to its customers and proceeding on an error about the law at the time, thinking that the services, that the relevant mail services were exempt, it did not charge VAT. Now, if you don't charge VAT or as, as part of your bill, but it turns out that VAT should have been charged, then you will make a small loss on the bill representing the VAT that you should have charged. So if, for example, I charged you a thousand, but forgot to charge VAT or thought I didn't need to, but it turned out that I should have done, then I will only be able to get about 830 or something, and I will have the, the 170 part of that thousand will be representative of that. Now, what Zipfit tried to argue was that although at the relevant time they did not have an invoice containing the amount of that they charged their customer, nevertheless, the law was clear that the relevant amount of that was part of the overall price which they charged. And so they should therefore be able to recover the input tax on that supply which they made. Now, what this required was an interpretation of two terms in the VAT directive and its transposition into domestic law. The first term was when the relevant VAT was due or paid. And the second was what we were to understand by the term invoice for the purposes of a compliant invoice, an invoice compliant with the VAT scheme. Now, we've had nearly 50 years of VAT, which of course is ultimately a, an EU tax. Uh, and yet here we are, and as I say, nearly 50 years later, and we're not clear about these fundamental terms of, of what we are to understand by the terms due or paid or an invoice for that purposes. Uh, and so because of the uncertainty, uh, and still in the transitional period, the Supreme Court made a reference to the Luxembourg Court to try and find the answer uh, to these two terms in the facts of this case. Now, after the end of the transitional period, it will not be possible, of course, to make references, except in certain cases, including citizens' rights cases. But that cases are likely to be common and indeed numerous, uh, both in terms of the internal application of VAT and whatever our new customs duties arrangements are going to be.
it seems to me that um, the, the law on customs duties and customs classifications is a potential growth area if um, we are to become an independent trading nation again. Uh, but my point is the terms due or paid or invoice uh, and terms like it will have to be interpreted in the future, no doubt. And so the starting point for that is undoubtedly going to be how, the e how EU law defines these terms and how the Court of Justice does so. Uh, and the same is going to be true for a vast swathe of legal terms uh, that are part of domestic law now as part of retained EU law. So we are still going to be going back um, to the EU legislation and what the Court of Justice has said about them and what it continues to say about them in order to be able to understand uh, the legal terms that are part of our law. Now, of course, it's true that we could decide to adopt our own approach um, and uh, we can have regard to what the ECJ says, uh, but still have our own view. Now, that may happen, of course, and there are, that's happened sometimes in the context of the European Court of Human Rights, um, that we have regard, but doesn't say we're bound. Um, if national conditions require a different approach, so be it. But it seems to me that judges, again, generally conservative with a small c, won't want to reinvent the wheel, and they'll be comfortable staying with the already established terms and the reasoning supporting them in ECJ decisions. So legal interpretation of terms then is going to, it seems to me, going to be um, continue to be dominated uh, in retained EU law by, um, e, by, by, by the Court of Justice's decisions. Now, secondly, there are also historic claims, um, and I'm afraid this is also in a VAT context, um, and it is exemplified by a recent decision of the Inner House in NHS Lothian Health Board just a few weeks ago. Um, I've got to blow my own trumpet for a minute. I was um, counsel for the successful NHS uh, Lothian Health Board in the Inner House, um, and what this case concerned was a so-called Fleming claim. So just to fill in the background, the UK has been serially in default of its EU law obligations in terms of allowing taxpayers to recover overpayments of tax. In the uh, 46 odd years that we were a member of the EU, the UK has only complied with its EU obligations in this field for about eight of those years. And for the rest of the time, for various reasons, it has been in breach of its EU law obligations. And this was ultimately highlighted in a 2008 House of Lords case called Fleming, which allowed a taxpayer to recover overpaid VAT going back to 1973. Now, as a result of Fleming, um, at last, the UK government introduced a, a transitional period to recover um, historic um, overpayments, and uh, NHS Lothian Health Board, along with many other taxpayers, and decided to put in a claim um, in, in, in the Lothian case um, between about 1974 and 1997. Now the problem these claims often give rise to, of course, is problems of proof. How do you prove either that you've made an overpayment or what it, what it was, how much it is? Because you know that you only have an obligation to maintain, to keep your tax records for about six years. Um, and in 2015, um, it will be hard, if not impossible, to prove what you paid in 1976. And so therefore we have to resort to the best evidence that we have and estimates and so on and so forth. But uh, despite its guidance, uh, the revenue have increasingly taken a strict approach uh, to rejecting taxpayers' claims, despite the taxpayer going to great lengths to try and accumulate the best evidence. Now in the inner house, uh, overruling the upper tribunal and the first tier tribunal, the inner house basically said that a flexible approach had to be taken to the standard of proof um, when establishing amounts of overpayment. Uh, and this was necessary because of the EU principle of effectiveness. Now, again, just to look at this case very briefly, what we saw was a claim between 1974 and 1997. I appreciate there might not be a lot of those moving forward, but who can tell? There is likely to be, in a number of fields, legal problems which arise later, which go back sometime into the past. And so EU law is going to have to continue to govern the remedies in those cases because, of course, it was the law that applied at the time. Just before we leave Lothian, um, it does actually say a number of other things that are interesting about the role of the first tier tribunal um, in um, its inquisitorial role and um, basically doing the best it can to decide cases rather than just giving up the territory because it's all too hard. Uh, 
So there's a number of interesting things in Lothian. Um, the revenue, as you would expect when they lose a case, uh, they apply for permission to appeal, they may or may not get it. So there may be another installment in Lothian in due course. Now, the final thing I want to just mention is, again, picking up on uh, Michael's point, um, because anyone who has ever had to have a case, anyone who's had a case where there is a time element involved, um, often has um, particular problems. The relationship between time and the law, I, I think, as the late Lord Roger once said, was one of the most difficult areas of um, legal practice. Um, and of course, you know, grappling with transitional arrangements is, is often one of the worst. But it's a species of that which I'm focusing on here. And as the slides, which I think are pretty detailed and hopefully make things clear, um, are looking at, are, are trying to show, is that historic claims can arise before exit day and be governed by the law as it applied at that time. Now, now that's more or less low there. So at the end of the day, uh, the remedies that Lothian was seeking were governed by a 2002 Luxembourg court decision. So the, the history, uh, the, the facts are in the past uh, and the law is, uh, applies as it applied at, at the time that the facts took place. But there will also be cases arriving af arising after exit date. So in 2025, for example, which turn out to be governed by court of justice decisions made either before or after exit day. Now, as regards cases arising, say, in 2025, which are governed by pre-exit CJEU decisions, so a 2015 decision, for example, it seems to me that the law on that is already clear and has been discussed by uh, Michael uh, and is pretty straightforward. So, for example, a UK case arises in 2025 about what is meant by a worker or a VAT invoice or a public contract, what these terms mean. Well, as the Withdrawal Act envisages, these will continue to be determined in accordance with the Luxembourg case law on exit day, because the, the law in the UK has taken a snapshot of, 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 of EU law as it applies. So there's no problem in um, interpreting terms and understanding EU law in light of Court of Justice judgments uh, before exit day. And as I have um, just been discussing, it seems to me that post-exit Luxembourg case law will still be at least persuasive on retained EU law, certainly when we're interpreting legal terms that have been derived from EU law, like invoice or worker. But ultimately, as Michael said, that is a, a decision for the UK Supreme Court uh, in, its, in its obligation to have regard to EU law. Now, more difficult, it seems to me, is where some post-exit Luxembourg case law has a bearing on a pre-exit case. So where a 2025 Luxembourg decision has some bearing on how a 2010 or 2015 UK court decided a case. Now why, why is this an issue? Well the reason is because of the very difficult decision of the Luxembourg court in uh, the 2003-2004 case of Kuhn and Heights. And what Kuhn and Heights uh, establishes is that there is a limited obligation on the national authorities to review administrative, but I would say also judicial decisions, which are later found to be contrary to EU law, for example, because of a later ruling by the Court of Justice in another case. Now, Kunin Heights is difficult, of course, because it mounts a challenge to legal certainty, right? So we all know principles of res judicata and legal certainty, of course, you can't open settled cases, they're, they're over. But EC, the, the Luxembourg court says, yes, but that has to be balanced against the requirement for the full effectiveness of EU law. In other words, effective judicial protection and effective remedies. And the balance the court strikes does, certainly does try to um, respect legal certainty. Um, and there are certain conditions in order to get into the Kuhn and Heights rule such as the relevant person who seeks to take advantage of the changing law uh, had been someone who'd exhausted their remedies in the earlier case and so on. So there are a number of conditions, and I don't want to exaggerate the potential scope of the Kuhn and Heights rule, but what it does mean is that there is an obligation to revisit decisions, uh, certainly administrative decisions, which were made by the government uh, but which are later found to be wrong in light of a subsequent ECJ decision. So, for example, if you had a 2025 CJEU decision 
that uh, clearly came to the conclusion that a previous 2015 UK decision was wrong, then there would be an obligation to review that. And then, of course, what's interesting is whether that would mean review only cases decided up until exit day or the end of the transitional period, or indeed all later cases, which, of course, opens then questions of whether all like cases should be treated alike. Now, if I'm bewildering everyone about this, let's just look at one very clear example. So we have a 2011 Court of Appeal decision in England in Tilianu. Um, I was also in this case, actually, but unfortunately for DWP. I say unfortunately because I was arguing for a position that I didn't agree with. But in Tilianu, the English Court of Appeal decided that a self-employed person could not, when they didn't have enough work, convert to the status of a job seeker for the purposes, uh, for the purposes of claiming job seekers allowance or, or, or social security benefits. Uh, and that was because um, you, you couldn't switch categories. If you started as a job seeker and you became unemployed, then you could retain that status of job seeker uh, for a limited period. But if you'd started as a self-employed person, then the Court of Appeal said, interpreting the relevant directive, well, the self-employed are never unemployed. You can be underemployed, but you're never unemployed. Uh, and so the self-employed could not convert. But some six or seven years later in this Guza case, the Court of Justice came to the, a completely different view. And it concluded that a, interpreting the directive, as the Court of Justice does, and teleological principles and so on, interpreting the relevant directive, it concluded that a self-employed person could retain that status and convert to be unemployed and claim job seekers allowance. Now, it seems to me that it follows from the Guza case uh, that Mr. Teliano's case should be revisited. Now, that's also going to happen inevitably, it seems to me, after, after, we, after the end of the transitional period. There is at least the possibility that a later Court of Justice decision will cast a shadow over a settled case in the UK, for example, one that wasn't referred to the Court of Justice, but which uh, has to be uh, revisited. Now today, that obligation to revisit comes from Coonan Heights and is derived directly from EU law. After exit day, it's arguable that it will not be. But it seems to me there is still a fundamental domestic constitutional rule of, rule of law obligation to treat like cases alike. It's part of the ubi ius, ibi remedium principle, um, that every right has to have a remedy. Uh, and so as part of our constitutional law subsequently, it seems to me that it will be prayed in aid in order to try and um, invoke uh, the Kuhn and Heights judgment. Now, this discussion of uh, citizens' rights leads on very nicely um, to the next talk, which is um, from Mark. Thank you, Dennis. Uh, my subject, as you will see, is EU citizens' rights to access public services after Brexit. And this is an important issue because in many cases, somebody in the UK who wanted to access local or public services would require to have a right of residence within the UK and to be able to prove that. Now, before Brexit, uh, EU, uh, also Norway, Iceland, Liechtenstein, and Swiss citizens and their qualifying family members were able to enjoy those rights of access to public services on broadly similar basis to UK citizens if they filled various residence requirements under EU law, or in some cases, they had other rights which UK law gave them to enjoy those services. And what the EU-UK withdrawal agreement uh, basically does is enact uh, in, uh, uh, put into effect uh, a replacement system of residence rights, and that's been put into effect in the UK in legislation which my colleagues have, have spoken about. And it's important to remember that we're talking about a large number of people here. The best estimate is that perhaps four million or more people in the UK will be able to rely upon the withdrawal agreement uh, to give them these rights, which will allow them to access many local and public services. But now the basics of citizens' rights are straightforward uh, in principle, and the withdrawal agreement aims to give rights broadly as now to EU and other citizens and their qualifying family members if they reside in the UK by the end of the transition period. And there's two types of status. The first one is settled status, which is similar to permanent residence under EU law for those who've had five years continuous residence in the UK. 
And that doesn't mean you've had to have been physically resident in the UK for five years, physically present for five years, uh, you are allowed to be out of the UK for up to six months, any 12 month period. Uh, Pre-settled status is for those with less than five years continuous residence who get status which can be converted to settled status when they reach five years uh, continuous residence in, in the UK. There are some exceptions, some shorter periods, you can still qualify for settled status. There's also some special arrangements in the case of Swiss citizens. I should emphasize that although settled status gives similar rights to permanent residence rights under EU law, not totally the same, and it's also worthwhile mentioning that in some cases, the withdrawal agreement gives fewer rights and permanent residence does at the moment, but sometimes under the withdrawal agreement or under the UK's own implementation of the UK or of a withdrawal agreement, you can actually get more rights than you currently have under EU law. Now, until the uh, end of the uh, uh, transition period as i say eu uh, citizens uh, can rely upon settled or pre-settled status or rights under eu law and that includes people who arrived actually after brexit day because freedom of movement uh, still exists uh, until the uh, end of the implementation period and if uh, somebody is resident in the uk by the end of a transition period they can actually apply for settled status up to six months thereafter and until that date will enjoy rights under the withdrawal agreement. So for EU citizens who were here before the uh, implementation period comes to an end, they can enjoy the rights under the withdrawal agreement for the further six months, even if they haven't actually yet made an application, even if they never intend to make an application. There is a six month grace period in effect to make an application. And if somebody applies for rights under withdrawal agreement, uh, they, uh, uh, they acquire those rights to which they're entitled, uh, including access to public services, until such time as a decision is made on that application. Now, that, what that means for those who are dealing with uh, EU citizens who uh, want to access local or national public services is that they will be uh, faced with applicants whose evidence of status and right to those services will vary depending upon the basis of their residence in the UK. If they've been given settled or pre-settled status, then they were simply able to demonstrate that through the uh, confirmation of that status. But there will also be people who have not yet been granted settled status or pre-settled status but they will have a confirmation from the Home Office that they've applied, and they will also be treated as people who have got settled or pre-settled status until such time as the application is dealt with. But of course, until the end of June uh, 2021, there'll be people who will be able to rely for accessing those services simply on presenting their EU passport or national ID cards. So there'll be a range of people with a range of types of proof of their status which people will be coming across. There may well be other evidence needed, for example, in the period between the end of the transition period, uh, at the end of this year, and the 30th of June 2021, uh, there may be people who uh, arrive after that period of time who will not be uh, entitled uh, to uh, the same uh, access to services because they will have uh, arrived after the end of the implementation period. So will there be a need, for example, to uh, have people showing when we arrived in the UK to prove they were here before the end of a transition period. That's a bit of an open question. We're not sure exactly how that will work out uh, in, in practice. Now, what is the nature of the rights that EU citizens uh, will be able to enjoy? Well, just to uh, remind ourselves that uh, settled status gives people what in UK immigration law is indefinite leave to remain. But unlike indefinite legal leave to remain in most other situations, this is an immigration status which is derived from an international agreement, which in certain cases can be relied on directly by EU citizens, as my colleagues have explained. 
And in addition, as I said earlier, the UK has also given some additional rights beyond those required by the withdrawal agreement. And indeed, the UK government's stated intention is that EU citizens and others will be able to continue to access in-country benefits and services on broadly the same terms as now. This means that they will retain their entitlement to health, education, benefits, social housing, including supported housing and homeless assistance. And that is indeed is what has been done and what's happening in most cases. But you will notice there is a qualification that they will be able to enjoy those services on broadly the same terms as now. We have yet to see exactly what broadly will mean in some uh, situations. Turning though to the rights which we know people will definitely have under the withdrawal agreement as implemented in the UK, uh, part two of the withdrawal agreement is the one that deals with citizen rights, and that is primarily rights to do with residents, but there's also others which are dependent upon those residents' rights. For example, there's rights regard to uh, exit and entry into the UK, Article 23 rights to eat treatment within the scope of part two, Article 24, various rights for workers and 25 for self-employed. And these, as we'll see, go well beyond rights of residents, uh, but to also uh, cover other very important employment, social rights, uh, as you can see. And it's also important to remember these rights will normally be enjoyed by those with settled status for their lifetime. They'll also be enjoyed by the qualifying family members of EU citizens who can then get settled status, even if they arrive in the UK in the future, after the end of the transition period, if a relationship existed at the end of the transition period, and in most cases by future children, which in the extreme case could even mean that for 150 years or so, there'll be people still relying on the, uh, trend, the withdrawal agreement to assert their rights uh, in the UK. Just a word finally on the enforcement of citizen rights. Uh, EU citizens in the UK will be able to ensure they enjoy the rights they're entitled to in a number of ways. Uh, first of all, of course, there'll be the general provisions for the continuing effect of EU law uh, under the withdrawal agreement under UK law, which my colleagues have discussed. Secondly, uh, it's important to highlight the provisions in Article 158 of the Withdrawal Agreement, which allows for reference by the UK Court to the Court of Justice of a question concerning the interpretation of Part 2 of the Withdrawal Agreement for eight years after the end of a transition period. And as uh, I've just uh, uh, shown, Part 2 doesn't just deal with citizens' rights narrowly defined, settled status, rights of that nature, but also covers a number of other uh, consequential rights which could be extremely important matters and eight years again is a long time and it's eight years in most cases from the date of the first instance proceedings being raised in the UK so when you add the time to get to the UK higher courts the time to Luxembourg you're talking perhaps a period of 10 years or more after a transition period where there could still be your British uh, cases being uh, heard before the Court of Justice. And finally, in addition to the uh, arrangements for references uh, to the Court, the withdrawal agreement also provides for the institution of an independent monitoring authority, which as you can see from this slide, has important powers, powers concerning breaches uh, of part two, the citizens' rights uh, provisions of the withdrawal agreement. Uh, and notice also that the breaches could be breaches not just of the UK government, but also of the administrative authorities of the United Kingdom. So all in all, you see a comprehensive range of measures designed to ensure that EU citizens in the UK, for the long run, will have rights uh, to which they are entitled to, asserted and protected and recognised by the courts. Thank you. I think it's better if I unmute myself, yes. Uh, um, thank you very much in, indeed, Mark. I think thanks again to Dennis. Uh, and thank you to the people who are still hanging on, as I can see from the count of participants. Uh, we now have, in principle, a question and answer session. I know that probably we're almost um, into minute 60 of our 60 minutes. <clears throat> but if there are any questions and answers, would you just click on the Q&A button
at the bottom of the page of your screen and just type in your question and then we'll see which of us, if any of us, feels competent to attempt to answer it. And if there are no questions, um, I think I'll just add the point, which perhaps can be brought up on the next and final slide, the contact point. Um, contact uh, Emma, here's her uh, address. If you want a copy of today's slides or any other questions, um, speaking strictly for myself, and I'm not speaking for Mark or Dennis, I'm quite happy once I've revised my speaking notes to make my speaking notes available. They um, are much more detailed than the 20 odd minute talk that I gave. They run into uh, 19 pages. I must confess, in the course of listening to Dennis and in the course of listening to Mark, I've realized already how much more I could have said in my own speaking notes, um, but that's a matter for another day. I see now that we have got one question, so I'm going to click on that and see what it is. Ah, this is from Chris McRae, and this is a question for Mark. Do the citizens' rights apply in a reciprocal manner to UK citizens in the EU? In essence, yes, to a global agreement applies equally to qualifying UK citizens in other EU countries as it does to EU citizens in the UK, with a qualification that uh, either uh, the UK or an EU state can provide uh, greater rights if it so wishes uh, to the relevant citizens. Uh, and as I said, the UK in some cases has actually given more rights to EU citizens than they would have to give under the uh, withdrawal agreement and equally that applies in some other EU countries and having said that I see that uh, Michael Gove complained this week that some EU countries weren't giving UK citizens a right to which they're entitled but in principle uh, the rights are reciprocal between the, uh, the two sides. Okay well I think that looks as if it does conclude our webinar. Thank you again Dennis and Mark, thank you Emma for organising yet another of these webinars and making sure that our slides are actually there. Thank you Dennis for operating the slides. Thank you everybody for listening and I must say that just as I was about to release you all there's another question so let's click on that. Oh it's Chris McRae saying thank you. I'm, I'm sure Mark would say his pleasure. So thank you, ladies and gentlemen, once again. And don't forget, if you'd like more of this sort of stuff, we're doing employment law next, uh, next week. Thank you and goodbye.